seated. Hallelujah. We're going to begin in, in, in Revelation chapter 3 this morning and get into some things that John talked about. Recently, I got an email from Dorinda, you know, who's serving the Lord in, her and Stuart are serving the Lord in Turkey. And, but last week she was at the Isle of Patmos. And how many know what the Isle of Patmos stands for? It's more than just a Greek island, a little Greek island out there. It's the place where John was banished. Um, and there they say, reported in this cave is where he received the revelation of the book of Revelation when he was caught up to the Lord on the Lord's day. And the, the legend goes that, that John was, was taken from Rome and banished to that island because they had put him in a vat of boiling oil, and he came out of the oil unscathed. So, you know, if you can't boil them, if you can't chop them, you kick them out. So that's what happened to John. He got kicked out and banished to this remote island, and that was where the Lord met him. He reported to live to about 100 years old, 94 years old. So uh, John actually died a natural death as far as we know. But uh, he was spared a lot of what the other apostles were spared. But she said she was at this island and she spent time during the day at this cave. And of course, you know what Catholics do, and if you've ever been to Israel, Jerusalem, or anywhere in Israel, everywhere there's reported activity, they, they came in and built big Gothic churches <laughs> over, over these places. And in many cases, it actually ruined the experience. You know what I'm saying? It'd be better if you didn't have to go through the church in order to get to the place. But anyway, they did that. And I think in some ways it's okay. It kind of preserves some things. But in this, this like this fortress-like church or monastery was built over this cave in Patmos where John received his revelation or supposedly received his revelation from the Lord. And so Dorinda went and hung out there for hours in the mornings. And she, the tour buses would come and go and all the people would come. And then they had a, the Orthodox were there and they were conducting mass and doing communion. And she stayed there so long that she got to know the, the priest. And uh, it's a pretty interesting story of, of the interrelation but this guy's been there for many, many years serving every day in, in this cave, in this place of revelation. And it reminded me that oftentimes God takes us into a cave in order to bring revelation to our hearts. We come into this place of life that oftentimes we despair of light. We despair of direction, purpose. But that can be ordered of God because it's usually in a place when we are faced with this great challenge of trying to find an answer that we actually begin to seek something more than what we've known. I guess life would be nice if we never had to do that. If we could just let life happen to us and everything would work out the way we've envisioned for it to work out, but often it doesn't, does it? So we often find ourselves trapped in a cave, trapped in a place that we didn't choose to be trapped in. And I'll talk in a few minutes about Paul's in, imprisonment and the time that he was in chains. But we, we see that the New Testament was basically birthed or spoken through these men that found themselves, what we would say in this age, between a rock and a hard place. They were often in a place that they had no answers, they could find no solution, they had no hope in this world. But what they found was something greater than this world had to offer. They found the, the thing in God that brought them to the next place. And I, I want to encourage you this morning that, that you can trust the Lord. You can really trust him. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're going to go through, there's only one place you can go where you're going to find what you need, and that's to the Lord. 
And so we see in the book of Revelations chapter 3, if you want to turn there or look on the board, I guess we'll have it there. But beginning in verse 14, we know that, that the Lord began to speak to John about the angels of the seven churches. And each, each church or each angel had a particular assignment or a particular uh, set of circumstances they were dealing with. And we, all, we know the story of most of these churches, you know, like the church of Philadelphia was called the church of brotherly love. How many want to be called the church of brotherly love? Amen. Hallelujah. It's better than the church of the holy stoners, right? We want to be the church of the brotherly love. And so he talks about the, the churches that, that the things that they needed, the things they do, were doing, he commended them, but he also began to speak words of correction to them. And God often does that with us, doesn't he? The Lord comes to affirm us and to confirm who we are, what we are, and what we're becoming. But he also comes to us like in this, we come to the table of the Lord, there's this time of judgment that comes. There's this time that we examine our hearts, and we see the parts of our life that aren't in conformity to what God wants us to be in our responses, our reactions, the way we think, the way we respond, the way we conduct our life. And we, we see a lot of the New Testament is, is given over to that. How do we conduct ourselves as Christians? How do we present ourselves before the Lord and before others? And that's important, isn't it? Because to be a Christian doesn't just mean that you have a private revelation of the Lord that between you and God, but it, it doesn't translate outside of you. No, everything that God's creating in you, He wants you to become a reflection of that. He wants you to become one that can properly represent the nature of who He is so that they may see Christ in you. How many would long to have that? The greatest compliment that you'll ever have paid in your life is someone will say to you, I see godliness working in you. I see the reflection of his nature in you. I don't see the things of the world manifesting through you, the language of the world, the attitudes of the world, the conditioning of the world, but I see the attitudes in the heart of Christ. You see, the Lord, the, the, at the very essence of who he is, is his motivation the motivation of the Lord, I don't think any of us this morning could challenge that motivation, could we? His motivation was pure towards us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not sin. I mean, should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God's motivation towards humanity was pure love. It's the essence of love. When we look at God, we see the very nature, the very character of what love is. And so when we want to define love, we don't have to define it by some human reasoning or human deduction, but we go to the very source of where love started in the beginning. He is the source of love. He's the fountain of love. He's the expression of love. Everything he does comes out of a motivation of love. Amen? Amen. Wow. Wouldn't it be great if we as humans that are now born again and become extra human, <laughs> because now we're no longer just in the flesh, but we're now with the Spirit. Wouldn't it be awesome if we too could have the pure motivation that God has, so that we don't come to any situation with any other agenda than His agenda? Hallelujah. There's nothing in us that seeks those things of ourselves. And this it was one of the things that Paul, that John's addressing through the revelation of the Lord that Jesus is speaking through him about these different churches. And um, so we get up to the church of Laodicea in verse 14, and to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, these things says the amen, the faithful, and the true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold, or I wish you were hot, but so then because you're lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. I don't know about you, but I almost find it offensive <laughs> that the Lord would want to vomit me out. <laughs> Amen. But that's what he's saying. It, when, you come, when, you, when you come to the Lord, 
there's something in you that must become ignited by his spirit so that there's nothing in you that's cold nor lukewarm. But there's an intensity of your spirit that never seeks, never seeks quitting to seek his face. Where you're continually progressing in your walk with God to the place that, that you're allowing the Lord to have his way in you. There's something about the, the confrontation that you have between you and him. It's devastating to your will. Most people want to meet God, but they don't want God to change their will whatsoever. We want to keep insisting upon our will, our way, our way of thinking, our way of actions, our way of being. But God said, I'm coming to bring you to become a brand new creation in me. I'm going to transform you into something greater than you ever imagined. If we only knew what, lay aside, what lays on the other side of the veil, we would be the first ones in line to rip it apart. If we only knew what's on the other side of the grave, we'd be the first ones to jump in it. If you only knew what God had prepared for you, you would become so intense and eager to receive it that nothing could stop you. It's only when we're blinded by this world, thinking that this world is the conclusion of what we are and what we're becoming, that we become, we become seduced by it to settle for something less than what God has created us to be. I'll get to that more in just a moment. Will you give me a moment? Yeah. Amen. So he says, because you say I'm rich, have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing, and do you not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? The moment you think that you are rich, that you have obtained, that you are intelligent, that you are gifted, that you are talented, that you have money in the bank, the moment you begin to take stock in those things that you think you are is the very moment that God said that you're miserable, poor, and naked, and wretched. Because you're depending upon those things of the world instead upon the things that come from heaven. Amen. There's no gold. There's no silver. There's no occupation. There's no position that you could obtain to in this world that merits nor carries any weight in comparison to what you receive from him. I was thinking this morning. Uh-oh, he's thinking. I was reflecting this morning. It says your old men shall dream dreams. Maybe I was dreaming. I was dreaming about all the days. Dreaming about the day I was driving down the road in Amarillo, Texas. That's when we were still living in the house that we were in when we got saved. Before we moved to the other house that was just real small. <laughs> Sometimes you decrease before you increase. I'm driving down the road. It had only been a few days, a few weeks maybe, since I'd met the Lord in the backyard. I'm driving towards the home. And I don't know if I've ever even shared this, but what an encounter I had with him at that moment. I began to weep tears of crocodile tears. And I just said, Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much that you love me that you gave your life for me. And it was the simplicity of the moment that rings in my heart today because as I look back on the times that I've met him in such a personal way, I'm thinking, man, I would like to go back and be a little more expressive to him how much he means to me, what he is to me, how many years I've lived my life often oblivious, 
even as a pastor, as a preacher, I've been oblivious to his presence the way that I should have been. Oftentimes, I've only allowed him to come into my heart on a limited, limited time or for a short period where I've almost like I've said, okay, Lord, I'm opening the door, but uh, let's sit in the front room because I don't really want you to get too comfortable with the rest of the house. I don't really want you, Lord, to go into the kitchen and see what I've been cooking or into the bathroom. I don't want you to go into the bedroom. Why don't we just stay out here in the parlor? Because really, Lord, I appreciate you coming, but I don't really want you to come that often or to penetrate that deep into my affairs. Oh, how I regret those days that I have not let him come into my house to the depth that he wanted to dwell with me. I counsel you, verse 18, to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, in white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with assalve, that you may see. Everybody touch your eyes. Say, Lord Jesus, help me to see the wonders and the splendors of your glory. Let me see, Lord, the courts that you've called me into, the place of dwelling that you desire for me. Let me see all that you've prepared. Amen. So as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. You know, when we talk about rebuking and chastening, it's probably our least favorite subject. I know it is with me. But, but let me say, when God's love comes to me, or I re- let God's love come to me the way he intends for it to, he often rebukes and chastens me. But the love is so intense that I never actually identify it as a rebuke or a chastisement. I view it as an impartation to my spirit. You see, when you're feeling that you're estranged and far off from your father, anything that he says to you that may be corrective is always offensive. Any correction he brings to you is always painful when you're feeling that you're estranged from him. But when you're sitting in your father's lap with his arm around you and your head laying upon his chest and his tears running down upon you because of his love for you, you don't even feel the pain that you would have felt from the gentle rebuke or chastisement that he gives you. Because all you can feel is how it ministers to you by love. In fact, I I venture to say God really kind of leaves us alone until we get to that place. And sometimes some of the things we think that God's doing to us, not really God doing to us at all, so we're doing it to ourselves. But if you'll just get, let this next verse ring true to you, it'll change your life. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Amen. Lord, 
it's all about communion. See, this whole thing we're doing is not about a religious exercise, a religious expression, or a, a religious feeling. It's all about communion, where God communes with us on the highest level of relationship. The intricate nature of God being infused into us so that we, we have literally take this bread of who he is and eat it until we become the image of who he is. We come, Lord, this morning, and we open our ears to hear the knock, and we say, come on in. We love you. We need you. Come in, Lord, to my house. Come, Lord, to your house. This is your place to dwell. Let the Lord abide within me. For the Bible said, if I abide in him and he in me, then whatever I ask in his name shall be done. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And it's amazing. When you get to that place, you'll never ask for anything that, that you would have asked for before. Because now what you'll ask for is not things, not positions, not talents, not giftings, not favor. All you'll ask in that place is more of you. Lord, I'm asking to know you more. That's what I want. I don't, oh God, come in. Come into my house and sit down. Then you pull out the paper out of your pocket and say, look, this is what I want, Lord. Could I have a new car? Could I have a new house? Could I have a new wife? <laughs> Could I have a new husband? Could I have better children? Could I have a better job? No, you don't even think of any of those things because it says that when you come to this place, you have no need because he is your Everything. Think not, it says in that day, that you have to ask any of those things of God. Doesn't the Lord know that you have need? Look at the, the nature around you. The birds have nests. The foxes have holes. The creation has all these things. And my God shall supply all of your needs according to your rich, his riches and glory. Because when you're in the presence of God, there's no consciousness of your need anymore. We've become a need-based Christianity because we're so estranged from his presence. The further we're estranged from his presence, the more our needs become glaring to us. The more our problems become obstacles that we cannot overcome. The, more, the less we're in the presence of God, the more we become critical of one another. The more we blame others for our own lack of whatever we need, we blame them for our own problems. The, less, the more we're out of his presence, the less we can forgive anyone because now we carry bitterness and anger in our hearts. But when we're in the presence of God, nothing that we are means anything. Because we're so consumed with this nature of this God that's so all-consuming to us. Wow. Isn't it awesome? Yeah. Philippians chapter 1. And I got this one marked with a dollar. It's my bookmark. I'm a highfalutin preacher. I use dollars for bookmarks. And I love Paul. Don't you love Paul? First Corinthians chapter, I mean, first Feb. Philippians chapter 1, not Philippians chapter 1. Did I say that the first time? Okay. I'm not losing it completely, right? In, in, in verse 7, Paul said, Just as it is right for me to thank this of you, because I have you in my heart, insomuch as both in my chains and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers with me of grace. You understand the context of Paul writing this letter to the Philippians. 
He was imprisoned in Rome in chains. It's amazing how that you take most people, you put them in a prison in chains. The last thing they think about is how can I bless someone else? (laughs) What would you be thinking about if you were in prison in chains? Oh my God, my life is over. Everybody's forsaken me. My family is estranged from me. My career is ruined. I'm forever marked as a felon. But Paul's saying, hey, wow, I have you in my heart. And it, the reason Paul could say that, not in a cavalier way or in an easy way, is because he wasn't, he may have been in the prison, he may have been in chains, but he really wasn't there. See, the chains and the bondages and the fears that control us, they only control us when we let them be the thing. But when he becomes the thing, none of those things are relevant to us anymore. So Paul said, if I'm poor, if I'm naked, if I'm downtrodden, if I'm homeless, or if I'm filled, or if I'm rich, or, or if I'm or in a place of blessing, it doesn't make any difference. This one thing there I've learned to be is to content in Christ Jesus. This is the same Paul that went over later in Philippians and said, and the peace of God that will pass all understanding will rule and guard your heart. In my old nature, I desperately want peace. How many want peace? I desperately want victory. How many want victory? I desperately want affirmation and confirmation of who I am. How many want that yourself? But see, those things are not the things that we seek. We seek Him. And in finding Him, everything else that we needed becomes ours. Because it's no longer now based upon my bank account, my, my location, my imprisonment, or my freedom. It's all based upon my revelation of the Lord. Amen. See, Paul in verse 8 says, for God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. How many, how many would like to live your life totally offense-free? Yeah. Totally offense-free. That hair lifts the devil every time. If you can be offended, guess what? Offense is coming your way. If you have a spirit of offense in you, everywhere you look, you will have find offense around you. In fact, offense will build a fence around you. If you have a spirit of rejection, everywhere you go, you'll feel rejected. If you have a spirit of anger, everywhere you go, you'll encounter strife. If you have a spirit of unforgiveness, all you'll see is judgment and condemnation coming your way. Hello? Hello? Yes. 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 I wouldn't even preach this to you if I haven't had to walk through this. I'm still walking through it. I don't know how easy it would be this morning if you come up here and slap me in the face. You probably don't want to find out, do you? (laughs) I'm still a pretty strong old boy for 71. No, I'm just kidding you. I wouldn't. Just come do it. You're going to find out who I am, aren't you? How are you going to find out who you are? You're going to find out who you are when someone does it to you. 
Now, maybe not a literal, but they could be. But when someone doesn't do what you want, then what are you going to do? Well, you don't understand. I can't do that because you don't understand my situation. I do understand your situation. You're telling me exactly who you are. You don't have to explain yourself. I don't want to hide, I don't want to hide my weakness. Here's my weakness. I'm not positive this morning, if you slap me on the cheek, that I won't respond. I'm not positive. You should come try it out. <laughs> because what if I did respond to you? What would you do? Would you become offended? Would you become offended because you, I was offended? Or would you be like Jesus? Amen? How do you start an argument? How do you stop an argument? Amen. I refuse to argue with you. I made a statement years ago, and it cost me a lot of members back in the 90s. This is a long time ago. I've been around here a long time. I said, if you've got a bunch of griping and moaning and groaning to do about me or about this church, just don't do it. Go do it somewhere else. I don't have time to listen to it. I mean, people got mad at that. You should not say that. You should be concerned about our concerns. No, I'm not. I'm not concerned about your concerns. All I'm concerned about, do you know him and the power of his resurrection? I don't care how many gripes and beefs and concerns you've got. It makes no difference. It won't cause anything to change. The only thing that changes you is when you let the door be open to your heart and let him in. Because I can never, no matter how much I would try to please you or appease you, it will never be enough for you until you let that happen to you. I'm not God. I can't do that for you. You've got to let him in. If, whether you let me in or not, I don't know. You've got to let him in. Right. Somebody knocking. You've got to let him come in. There's, I told this before. There's a lady that sang here years ago named Terry Gibbs. Gosh, how long ago was that? 90? You could look it up. There was a number one song called Somebody's Knocking. And she came and sang the church. She didn't sing that song, thank God, because it's talking about somebody knocking is a devil in blue jeans. <laughs> you get the meaning. Uh, <laughs> but she was singing gospel. Her, her and, uh, what's her name? Barbara Fairchild. Barbara Fairchild used to sing. How many of you remember Barbara Fairchild? Barbara Fairchild was a great friend of ours. She sang, wished I was teddy bear. Just living and loving, feeling no care. It was a number one country song. And so Barbara Fairchild come and Terry Gibb, and Terry was blind, and, and she had turned her heart to the Lord. And she sang, somebody's knocking. I'm going to tell you, somebody's knocking this morning. It's not a devil in blue jeans. It's a Christ. It's a Jesus that's clothed with fine linen, clothed in robes of righteousness, coming to bless you and minister to you. Amen. Darren, were you here when all that happened? Maybe before you got here. Darren got here when the Imperials came. Somebody remember the Imperials, right? How many remember the Imperials? Hallelujah. I love that old, that old quartet music. I know you'd never believe it looking at me that I'm from that generation, but I love that old quartet music. I really did. Amen. So Paul sang that we live our life to bring glory to God. That even in the midst of our chains, in the midst of our challenges, he said, I'm praying in verse 8, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Being filled, everybody say, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of our God. 
Go over in verse 19, it says, For I know that this will turn out for my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that, it, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or whether by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean that fruit is coming from my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better. I mean, if you've ever partaking of the things that Paul partook of by partaking of the richness of this inheritance, of this encounter that he had with God. If you've ever been in the courts of God in the way he's describing, you understand exactly what it means. Because when you come into the, the presence of God in such a way that it's undeniable, un, unmistakable that this is God in the midst of me right here then you understand what it means. Oh, it would be so much better if I could transition out of this struggling flesh into this presence of God. So that's why I don't ever feel sorry for anyone that passes this life that's in Christ. I don't feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for us because we miss them. But I've been there. I've been in the courts of God. I've been in the places of the Lord, not only on a daily level, but I've been there by experience where God has caught me into that level and I know what he's speaking about. There's nothing that compares to the glory of God. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nothing of this life should satisfy us. Nothing of this life should anchor us down to where we put our stock and our, our trade in all the things of this world. We say, God, we long to be in the presence of the Lord, whether I live or whether I die. Lord, everything is gain for me. But I guess I'll stay around. Sometimes people stay around longer than we want them to. But Paul, Paul, I think he had a thorn in the flesh, but I think he was also quite a thorn himself. <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if we could just Say, God, open up the window of heaven and let Paul come down your staircase this morning and let him walk up here and let's let him preach a while. What would you think about that? You'd think, give us Bill Hart again. I mean, you're talking about ripping you. I mean, just the very presence of that man would rip you. You know what I'm saying? How, how would he, how would, we, we all think, oh my God, we're just praying that Jesus shows up in the church in bodily form. <laughs> you better watch what you're praying for. Oh, if only Paul could be speaking to us instead of that Bill Hart. <laughs> oh my Lord. Oh. Oh, if I could just meet the Apostle Paul, if I could just be in the presence of Joshua, if I could just be with Isaiah, the prophet. Yeah, come on now. Yeah, that's a good ambition, but guess what? Mm, you might find yourself being scraped off the floor. Why? Because the same righteousness that's in Christ is also manifested in human flesh to those that know him. And I'm not saying that these guys would be mean or cruel, but I'm telling you this, it would be confrontational. Because he would say, whether I live or whether I die, I live in Christ, but if I die, it's gain. So Paul we welcome you. We don't really welcome you. We welcome the one that, that, that saved you on that road to Damascus, that blinded your eyes, that one that transformed radically you from a Saul, bitter, hating, 
Jewish uh, Christian persecutor, murderer, to this great lover of God, to this man that gave everything in his life. He gave all the things that he obtained to you. This man that, that suffered beatings and persecutions. This man that suffered isolation and bondage and imprisonment. This man that suffered scorn and hate. This man that was cast out even by his own brethren on many occasions. This man that often walked alone. This man. We must have him, Lord. Let that same spirit that was in Christ, that was in Paul, let that be in us. That we may find our refuge under the shadow of the Most High God. Psalms 91, and I'll just close with this because this, we've got to close with something sweet. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He will deliver us from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under your wings... His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, but 10,000 is your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked, because you've made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, you've made this one your habitation. <laughs> no evil will befall us, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you. You know, we had a gr group here on Friday night of another church that I'm a very dear friend of the pastor, and it's a larger group than ours considerably, and they were having their semi-annual Friday, Friday meeting, and their church isn't large enough to hold them, so I had them come here, and we had lots of people. I mean, it was packed out, and great worship, and the pastor was so, so blessed. I just got to read you a little bit of what he said. Can you give me a second? Is it time for lunch? Okay. See, I always con con consult the Lord to find out what time it is. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many know you, hey, nice to know what I'm talking about. Okay. You got to consult that one that God gave you because they're the spokesman of the Lord. But, but pastor said this. I just was so blessed by this. He said, what an incredible blessing to be with you last night. Thank you for the use of the building, your gracious hospitality, and your kind words. I got to speak over, you know, I had an ulterior motive. Darren was so helpful and willing to serve. Oh, yeah. And I know he worked hard for us. Listen to this. It was one of the most impactful times in God's presence that I've ever experienced. Top five in my life. And I know some of that is attributed to the history, the intercession, and the blessing of your house. Yes, yeah. Amen? And I just want to tell, yes, a lot of it is contributed to that. Because there's a presence of the Lord yes. that we enter into. Right. Amen? Amen? And we become these people of habitation, this people where God dwells in the midst. He will keep his angels charge over you. And this woman got up and prophesied Friday and she said, I just see that there's like these large angels. She'd never been in this house before. These large angels around. And we're smiling at one another. And she said, there's this like open heaven right here. <laughs> wow. Amen. Amen. Some of you have been saying lately, where's the open heaven? Where's the presence? Nice. 
It's waiting for you. Well, I can't feel it anymore. I can't sense it. There's no more feather clouds nor gold dust, so we, we don't have the glory anymore. Someone told me recently, I'm just praying the glory will come back to the house and we'll have gold dust again. It's not the glory. It's a manifestation, but that's not the glory. You want the glory? I want to tell you what, gold dust is nice. I loved the gold dust. We had it for 12 years. Mahash carried the gold dust for 12 years. But he'll tell you as well as I will. You can substitute that for the, the intimacy that God wants to give you if you're not careful. You can substitute these things of the world, the things of the world. You can substitute even the things of God that you've had for the true authentic revelation of the Lord in your life. I've seen very few people that walk with God that ever chase miracles. Very few people that, were, that really walk with God that chase signs and wonders. They always run to the end of the rope because one day the signs and wonders aren't there when they think they should be. So they become discouraged and quit. But boy, when I find someone that says, Lord, I want to abide in your presence. My life, Lord, is yours. I find someone of etern- with someone that has eternity in their heart. Someone that no matter what they go through. I mean, if you're so used to all this stuff, what are you going to do when they throw you in the jail and they put chains around you? And you say, Lord, show me the gold dust. I'm going to guarantee you, gold dust won't give you, much, give you much solace at that moment. And I'm not putting down the gold dust. We've got a plaque out there to it, for God's sake. <laughs> and, you're, and, you're, and you're sitting on it. This whole floor is covered in gold under the carpet. So don't give me that. You know what I'm talking about. If you don't, you're in trouble. (laughs) I'm in the jail. There he is. Hallelujah. He's with me. Glory to God. The thing I've learned the last year, I went through, in my personal life, I went through more in the last year, physically and even emotionally, Challenges, challenges, challenges. And some of you say, well, I, you haven't gone through anything. Pastor, you should see what I've been going through. You want to come walk in my shoes? I don't want to walk in yours. I'll walk in mine. Amen. I know you may have gone through something far more than I did, but I don't care. I went, when I, what I went through, I wouldn't pay any attention to what you were going through. Because my problems were big, bigger than I thought your problems were. So I'm sorry. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, oftentimes people think that everybody ought to be focused on their problem. Guess what? There's someone in the crowd that's got a bigger problem than you. But the only solution for any of you and for me is to find him in the midst of the problem. Right. That in the midst of all this, that I come and I abide with God and all of a sudden I'm in the shadow of the Almighty. And no matter what I'm going through, my problem may be worse than yours or it may be only a minuscule compared to what you're going through. So what? Both of us need to find a place of habitation in the Lord. Hallelujah. For whether I die or whether I live, it's all in Christ. If I'm being persecuted, it's all in Christ. If I'm being misunderstood, it's all in Christ. For it says this, he will... He will give his angels charge, verse 12, they shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot because he set his love upon you. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he's known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him or be with you in trouble. I will deliver you. And I will honor you with long life. I will satisfy you and I will show you my salvation. Amen. Hallelujah.